Hi everyone, so I'm back with another video. This is the second video on the reproductive system. The first one I spoke about was the male reproductive system. This one I'm talking about female reproductive system. So let's get started. Alright, so the reproductive system, and I kind of started off with this when I spoke about the males, um, serves a variety of purposes. And all living things, the one thing they must do is reproduce. Now when we talk about um, a very complex organism like ourselves, we have a reproductive system. And the goals of the reproductive systems are such. First, um, you must have production of gametes. Gametes are sex cells, so like eggs and sperm. Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing, the whole purpose of reproductive system as well is to ensure that these gametes do unite. So if you have an egg and a sperm, you can't have an egg just out of nowhere forming into a baby. It needs to be fertilized. So through the fertilization, then you can have creation of life. So this video is going to focus on the female anatomy and regulation that allows for this to happen. All right, so this is a very simple diagram that I found that showed the basic structures. Here, this is showing you some of the outside region that you can see the labia um, minora is a smaller portion in between and the labia majora and the clitoris region. Now, the clitoris came from the same type of tissue as the penis or the penile tissue that we see in the male reproductive system. Um, we have our vaginal region and then we have um, these structures here. So the uterus, the uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes on both sides, and we have the ovaries. These are some of the basic foundational structures that make up the female reproductive system. Now taking a closer view of it, a more lateral or side view, um, once again we see the outside opening. Here is the vaginal region and this is being shown in relation to some of the other organs like the bladder. The bladder is found in front of it. That's why we always hear when women get pregnant um, their bladders kind of get a little squished and you know they may leak urine or they may feel like they need to pee more often and it's because you know the uterus is right on top of it. Now here's showing you the opening of the uterus called a cervix. Um, here's the uterus, here's the fallopian tube, here's the, the ovary. So there are also some glands that are also present um, we have our clitoris on the outside, and we have our labia majora and minora that's there. So this is just showing you a side view of the female reproductive system. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the process of oogenesis. That is the making of the egg, and the egg is the female gamete, and it's really important that we have it. And there has to be some properties associated with the egg in that it needs to be um, one N, okay? Um, one end meaning that it is haploid in nature. So it only, instead of having 23 times 2, it only have 23 um, sets of chromatids. All right, or 23 chromatids. So to start out, we have what's called a oogonium. Oogonium. The oogonium is 2N. That's kind of like the originator cell, the cell that will give rise. So when we were talking about spermatogenesis, the making of the sperm in males, you have the spermatogonia that after it went through the meiosis process, it ended up with four sperm cells, okay? But there's something slightly different that goes on here because we do not have, um, as you can see here, just taking a glance, um, from the one oogonium, we do not have four equal cells. We only actually have one, so we'll revisit that. All right, so the oogonium is 2N, meaning that it has 46 chromosomes, okay? That has to go through a reductional process. Um, and that reductional process is called meiosis. Meiosis. Okay, so meiosis is a selectional reduction. Now I'm going to draw a line um, right here. Okay, so while you were in utero, so before birth, all the eggs that you would ever have or the originators of the eggs are already made. So you already have your oogonium that has 
gone ahead and made the primary oocyte. Now the primary oocyte is that is still 2N when we're talking about chromosome numbers. But the primary oocyte becomes arrested. So it kind of stops in prophase 1. Prophase is a part of meiosis, okay? So after birth and when puberty has started and when ovulation is going on, then it comes out of that arrest phase of meiosis and then proceeds, okay? So as it proceeds, as the egg is starting to mature, we have a division of the primary oocyte to become a secondary oocyte. Now there's one thing I want to note here. When we spoke about sperms, we had equal cells when we were dividing. But when we talk about oogenesis, something is slightly different. Um, we do have our secondary oocyte, but when that primary oocyte divided, you ended up with one secondary oocyte in a polar body. A polar body is not able to be fertilized. So after the second round of division, all right, that secondary oocyte will then divide to form that mature ovum and then went ahead to make another polar body. All right, and that first polar body will divide to form further polar bodies. So at the end of oogenesis, one oogonium ends up only making one egg that is functional and three polar bodies. So that kind of puts pressure on us women, you know, because men, they can make four sperms from one spermatogonium and those four sperms can potentially be functional. But with us women, only one egg is functional after the process of oogenesis. So it's actually quite interesting to see that. Okay, so since I'm finished talking about um, oogenesis, now we're going to talk about the ovarian cycle, what actually happens in the ovaries. Now, we do know that the ovaries produce estrogen, amongst other things, but I want to just focus on this part right here. All right, so the ovarian cycle actually happens in two phases. We have the follicular phase and we have the luteal phases. And during the follicular phase, what's actually happening here is the follicle, that's where the egg is maturing, um, starts to grow and develop. Um, when the follicle is released, that process is called ovulation. Okay, so ovulation typically happens in the mid-cycle um, or the typical cycle, average cycle, I should say, is about 28 days. It could be shorter or it could be longer. But usually around the midpoint is when ovulation occurs. After ovulation occurs, we, end in, we enter into a phase called the luteal phase. Um, and that's where the, the ovary, where the portion where the egg was released, forms something called a corpus luteum. And that corpus luteum actually produces a hormone called progesterone um, that will continue to be secreted. So let's take a look at the hormones that's actually going on here. So during the follicular phase, I want you to notice that a hormone called follicle-stimulating hormone is higher. At this stage, the follicle-stimulating hormone, which is released by the pituitary, is actually working on the follicles to help mature the egg. I do want you to notice that there's another hormone here called luteinizing hormone. Now, the luteinizing hormone as well as the follicle-stimulating hormone peaks right before ovulation. That kind of helps to trigger the event of ovulation. So some of those ovulation prediction kits, what they're actually looking at is the rise in this hormone. Okay, So after ovulation occurs, that's when the follicles release the ovulation. Then we enter into that second phase that I mentioned, which is the luteal phase. Now, I want you to notice that the follicle-stimulating hormone levels kind of dip a little bit, right? And the luteinizing hormone is also lower here. Now, the hormone that we see that's being regulated, I'm going to talk about down here, okay? So this is what we see regarding follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, what happens in the follicular phase and what happens in the luteal phase. Now, let's take a look at the hormones that are being released by the ovaries because the ones I just spoke about were the pituitary hormones, okay? Now, in the um, follicular phase of 
the ovarian cycle. What we actually see is the estrogen kind of um, takes a nice little peak right before ovulation occurs. So estrogen levels are um, raises up to a pretty decent level. Progesterone pretty much is not being produced by the ovaries at this point because it's produced after ovulation. So this black line here represents ovulation. After ovulation occurs, that means the egg is released, um, the corpus luteum is produced. And I'll show you in the next slide what the corpus luteum looks like. When it's produced, progesterone levels start to take a rise. And the progesterone level plays a critical role at helping to build up the inside of the uterus and prevents it from breaking down. I'll show you that when I talk about the uterine cycle. Estrogen does not keep climbing, all right? So it kind of peaks, um, kind of stationary, and then it will dip. Now, right before the period starts or the menstrual, the menzies, what we see is that estrogen or estradiol and progesterone drops. And that happens here because um, that corpus luteum kind of dies off. The corpus luteum is what produces that progesterone level um, to keep it going. Okay, so this is just showing you the corpus luteum formation. So after ovulation occurs, so this is showing you um, what's happening as a follicle stimulating hormone is working on the follicle to mature it. And remember, we get that rise in luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. And then we have our ovulation, okay? After ovulation occurs, that um, sac or that empty follicle that the egg was re produced in and released produces this yellow body called corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes a progesterone. Remember I said that progesterone helps to maintain and build the uterine lining to prepare it for the embryo that may be arriving. Um, if it never arrives, if there's no fertilization that takes place, the corpus luteum will break down and when it breaks down, progesterone level drops. And when it drops, that marks the period. Now, if a woman is pregnant, the corpus luteum will not break down because it will be receiving signals from the embryo that implanted itself in the uterus. Um, but right now I'm talking, I'm going to be talking about when um, there is no implantation. All right, so let's take a look what's happening to the, uter the uterus. This is known as the uterine cycle, and it too responds to the hormones that is released from the ovaries as well as the pituitary, because, you know, the pituitary helps to regulate um, these ovarian hormones. So here is when, let's say this is when the period starts, right? Day one is when we count the cycle. I know some people will actually count when the period stops. It's usually when it begins, okay? So when it begins, you enter that follicular phase that I was telling you about, where you do have that rise in the LH and the FSH, um, and then ovulation occurs. But I want to take a look at the progesterone levels. You remember I said the progesterone levels rise. And when it rises, this is showing you the thickness of the uterine lining or the endometrium. I want you to notice that it starts to build up. But right after ovulation, it really starts to build pretty well and maintain. And that's all due to the hormone that's of progesterone that is made. So the uterine cycle is what it looks like. And remember, right before your period starts, we have that crash in the hormones of estrogen and progesterone. Some women actually are very sensitive to that change, and that can cause PMS. Um, that can cause bloating, irritation, pain. So there are things that are associated with this. But this is showing you the uterine cycle. All right, this is showing you what's actually happening. Um, when menstruation occurs, when you have that crash of the hormones because an embryo have not been implanted and a corpus luteum starts to die, um, we see the breakdown of the tissue. So you get um, the sloughing off of the tissues as well as some blood that's being produced. And the cells also produce a factor that will prevent clotting from happening so you can release the contents. Now, remember I said that this is just the average. Some people can have shorter cycles. Um, some women have 21-day cycles. Some women have maybe 36-day cycles. We have some individuals that may only get 
um, their period twice a year or even three times a year. In cases of that, there are some other hormonal things that's going on. But just know that menstruation is a very important process to kind of break down that tissue that has built up if pregnancy has not occurred. Okay, so this is the same um, diagram I showed in the male reproductive system, but this time I'm not going to talk about the hormone signaling in male puberty. I'm going to talk about hormonal signaling with female puberty, okay? So once again, that gonadotropic releasing hormone that is produced by the hypothalamus um, is a tropic hormone because it's about to stimulate other hormones, but it will allow the anterior pituitary to release two hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So before I said that these in the male help to produce testosterone, but right now I want to focus on the female, okay? So the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone will trigger the ovaries to produce a hormone called estrogen, okay? Now estrogen will to do two things. It will allow the female secondary characteristics to start happening. So that means breast development in puberty that's seen here is because those luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone has triggered the ovaries to make estrogen. The hip starts to broaden. We get um, pubic hair that starts to grow. We may get some body odor. Growth hormone is also triggered, as well as the male growth hormone also responds. So that's one thing that estrogen does. But another thing it does, it allows the egg to be produced in oogenesis or folliculogenesis to make the egg to be ovulated. All right, so there is feedback mechanisms, feedback loops that occur. But I want you to bring it back to that hypothalamus produces that gonadotropic releasing hormone that helps to regulate and trigger the puberty events. All right, so... Um, of course, I can't stop this video until I talk about some of those pathologies that are associated with um, the female reproductive organs and some of the most common ones. So to first start off is to talk about some of the cancers. You can have cancers of any of the structures. You can have uterine cancer. Someone can have cervical cancer. Someone can have ovarian cancer. Um, so we see here the cervix, that's the opening of the uterus can start developing abnormal cells and that those abnormal cells can turn into cancerous tissues. Now some of the cervical cancers have been caused by a virus called the human papillomavirus. There is a vaccine that protects against some of those human papillomavirus strains that can cause this. Um, it can be transmitted through sexual activity. Um, but in others, some cervical cancers are not caused by HPV, just to, to give note to that. We also do have cancers that can rise in the ovaries. Um, there's a, um, here, this one just shows you some of the stages. If you have a cancer that has started out and is only in one ovary, that's known as a stage 1A cancer. But if you have it in both ovaries, it's stage 1B. Um, and stage 1C is when you have a cancer in and on the surface of the ovary. So it's kind of like a dual thing. So ovarian cancer and cervical cancers are some cancers that we do see in women as well as uterine cancers. Um, another uh, thing that we see in a lot of women actually is ovarian cyst. Now from time to time women can get ovarian cyst and the ovarian cyst can rupture on its own and, and they can resolve on its own. A lot of females have it and not know. But there's a subset of those women that will start developing multiple cysts and become polycystic to form polycystic ovarian syndrome. And this generally is because that follicle stimulating hormone levels kind of aren't at the point where it should be and it never causes a release of an actual follicle and you end up with a lot of these multiple um, cysts on the ovaries that can actually um, throw off other hormones causing other issues in the female. I did talk about PCOS in the endocrine video that I did prior so if you want to take a look at that and get more details feel free to go and take a look at that video. 
Now, another thing that we see are uterine fibroids. Fibroids can be small, fibroids can be large. What they are are um, not malignant, they're non-malignant, so they're benign growths that's found in the uterus. Um, and there are studies that show that estrogen levels can somehow be correlated with uterine fibroids. Um, if they're becoming painful or too large, they can be removed through surgery, or if it becomes too overwhelming, hysterectomy may have to be done to remove the uterus. Okay, so it's quiz time. Let's see what you guys remember. Which organ of the female reproduction or female reproductive system is responsible for releasing an egg or the ovum? Okay, so the choices are fallopian or uterine tube, ovaries, uterus, cervix, or vagina. So which organ is involved in releasing the egg? If you said ovaries, you are correct. From one oogonium, so now we're talking about oogenesis, how many functioning eggs are formed. So for one oogonium, how much functioning eggs are formed? Because remember in the male, we ended up with four. So if you said one, you're correct. So remember we end up with one ovum, okay, and then we end up with three polar bodies. The polar bodies do not go and be fertilized. It is only that one ovum that does. After ovulation occurs, what is formed in the ovaries and produces progesterone? So there is something that is produced in the follicle after the egg has been released. And remember, this thing produces progesterone to ensure that the endometrium, the uterine lining, remains thick and full. If you said corpus luteum, you're correct. What event signals menstruation to occur? So with this one, you have to select all that applies. So um, when the period occurs, certain things have to happen. All right, so the choices that I have here is degeneration of the corpus luteum, egg being released from the ovaries, a drop in progesterone levels, a breakdown of the endometrium, or rise in progesterone. Which one or which one of these um, will actually start menstruation? So you're supposed to select all that applies. So degeneration of the corpus luteum, what that does, it causes a drop in progesterone. And that drop in progesterone breaks down the endometrium and that's when you get your period. Which of the following hormones is or are important in stimulating estrogen during puberty? All right, so select all that applies. We have progesterone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, or none of the above. If you select a luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, you're correct. So you remember we have um, two phases in the actual ovarian cycle. Um, we have the follicular phase and the luteal phase. Remember, these ones, they will help produce estrogen. And, you know, estrogen can go back through that feedback loop. But remember, this will help with that production of the egg. So hopefully you got 100% on the quiz. Um, I would love to hear what you learned or how you did on the quiz. So just leave a comment down below and let me know how you did. Um, if you did not take a look at the male reproductive video, please go back and take a look at that. That is um, a separate video. So until next time, bye.